Welcome back. Now to what's trending in true crime. The parents of defendant Christopher Greger, the man accused in the treadmill abuse murder trial, say their family has been getting threats ever since little six-year-old Corey died. David and Carolyn Greger testified outside the presence of the jury so that the judge could rule whether or not the jury can hear their testimony in the trial. The defendant's father testified about seeing the little, the bruises on Corey. Did there come a time when you saw any bruising on Corey on that day? We did. Okay, where did you see the bruising? Um, I saw a bruise on his forehead. Okay, and did you or your wife speak to Corey about the bruise? We did. Okay, was it you that spoke to him or your wife? Both. Okay, what if anything did you, I, I, did you say to Corey? What, what happened? Um, and Corey said, uh, I fell on a treadmill. Mm. Now, the judge decided that the grandparents can testify next week when the case resumes, but with some restrictions. The question we're asking this morning, could Corey's bruises damage his father's case? Let's bring in our guests. Still with me, criminologist, author, and professor at St. Thomas University, Dr. Debbie Goodman. Also with us, the former director of the Department of Family and Children's Services in Georgia, Tom Rawlings. And joining us from Florida, celebrity civil attorney, John Phillips. It's great to see you all this morning. Ooh, this is a tough one. I, I know this breaks all of your hearts. Uh, this is awful. Um, and it's also not fair the parents are getting threats, and we're going to get to that in just a moment. Uh, but the first question we want to talk about, the case, the legal case, and if granddad comes in and testifies that he saw these bruises, what does that do to his son's case then? Attorney John Phillips, would you start us off, please? I have a six-year-old. My six-year-old begs to work out with daddy. These treadmills are dangerous to begin with. And when you have a father that's either trying to live vicariously or over push a child of that age, it, you get this. And the bruises certainly will be key evidence. Having a family member introduce the bruises very important for for conviction and then you have you know these photos and the video from the from the workout room that just shows a father that's that's going too far and, and killed his son mm -hmm. and john let's talk some more about that so the state called uh their medical expert witness a forensic pathologist named dr thomas andrew to say this was a homicide that that's how little Corey died i've got the clip let's listen to what he's saying about the pattern of abuse not just one event right. these injuries given their pattern and distribution are consistent with having been inflicted by another person Therefore, any death that is related to the actions of another person is from a medical examiner standpoint, from an epidemiological or public health standpoint, homicide. Mm. Dr. Debbie Goodman, want to go to you next, please. Is that the key for the state to getting to this charge of, of homicide here? Because the incident on the treadmill is horrific, yes. Did it cause his death? That's kind of what's questionable. It seems to me they need to include other instances of abuse. Uh, would you talk to us about uh, their proof problems, please? Yes, of course. And good morning again, Julie. Pleasure to join. You know, this case is just beyond brutal and barbaric. And to answer the question, I did create a theory on, on circumstances such as this, A, B, C, D abuse, bullying, control, and ultimately death. And I think that creates the foundation for the prosecution's case here. It's not just a singular issue, a second time, a third time. This is just a repeat performance from this individual to his innocent six-year-old child of consistent abuse, bullying, ultimate control that led to his death. And I think the justice system will react and respond with swift, severe, and certain penalty. Mm -hmm. Right, Dr. Debbie. Uh, Tom Rawlings, last but certainly not least, want to tap into your expertise. So uh, one incident, does one incident make child abuse? Maybe, maybe it does, right? Is the pattern what's key here? 
um, for child welfare investigators? Are they looking for a pattern of abuse typically when you see cases like this? Because we know they were called many times and how this wasn't stopped is beyond all of us here. Uh, your thoughts, please. Sure, Julie, good morning. Um, so the pattern is important here for a couple reasons. Number one, certainly from a child welfare perspective, you can have a situation where a child, where for example, a parent loses his temper and may strike a child or hurt a child. And that can be dealt diff with differently in the child protective system than if you have a situation where there's ongoing abuse. In this case, I think what's critical is that Dr. Andrews testified originally that he thought that this could have happened any time between early morning and afternoon. So it could have <laughs> happened under that theory when uh, the mother had had Corey. But what I don't understand about, you know, I'm not sure how the treadmill situation helps uh, Gregor in any way. It shows that he was overbearing perhaps abusive earlier and that really I think focuses the time frame for the injuries that led to his death in uh, in that period when he had custody and really makes him I think more susceptible of being found to be the one who inflicted the injury we have a who done it mm -hmm. question Mm hmm. I really like what you're saying there, Tom. It, it's that that treadmill incident signals to look right around these dates in time. And as Dr. Debbie said, it was barbaric. That treadmill incident was absolutely barbaric. So now every day around that time window, they're going to be looking for the bruises to show that pattern of abuse. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the defendant's parents because um, them getting threats we know is just wrong. And the defendant's mother, her name is Carolyn, said that the threats began almost instantly after after her grandson's death. As we're driving, my son calls me. Which son? Yeah. Daniel, my youngest. He was home by himself. I don't know how long after it this was. He calls me. He's getting phone calls at the house. On our house phone. Threats. People are, your your brother's a murderer. You know. This was like, it, it was ridiculous how quickly. Yeah, you know, we always say on this show, don't blame the family members. You know, people are all responsible for their individual actions. This is an adult here, right here, this defendant. If anybody gets mad at him, uh, you know, that's on him. But his family, they're innocent in this. So let's talk about how he's going to be defended. We know he's got a really sharp defense attorney. What kind of case is he going to put on? We know he's promising a big one. Let's bring our guest back in. Attorney John Phillips, what do you expect to see in defense of Christopher Greger? Um, magic. Don't look over here. I've got, I've got, I've got something for you over here, uh, called probable cause. And and you know, to the point brought last, you know, in the last discussion, it, it, he didn't die. It, you know, fall off the treadmill and die. Right. It, that would be an easy case to solve. It's the it's the systemic and systematic view, abuse that led to this that, that led to this poor child's death, and we don't know what was the fatal wound and how long it took to necessarily kill him and 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 how he sustained it. But it, you know, it's they're going to focus that, like you said earlier, brilliantly. This could have been in the mom's care. This could have been over here. This could have been over here. And that's, you know, that's where probable cause lives. Right, right, John, exactly. Uh, mom doesn't exactly have the cleanest hands in this one, we know. That little child was failed miserably. Uh, we're just about out of time. Tom Rawlings, I want to give you uh, the last word on this. Would you take us home? Your thoughts, what we can take away from this brutal case? Well, Julie, if I think the main thing to take away is that our child protective services are, they do good work every day, but they are overwhelmed. Um, they often, in this situation, of course, they probably treated this as a custody battle that they didn't want to get involved in. But I think it does show that our child protective workers really are the front lines of defense for protecting children like Corey. And we have got to make sure that they are trained jobs and supported in doing their jobs support our front line of defense i like that that is the perfect note to end on so true tom rawlings dr debbie goodman john phillips thank you all for your expertise and your time this morning have a wonderful weekend i hope to see you all soon